Why was Emery Tate so famous? A lot of you may not know, but Emery Tate has been extremely well known for a very long time. He would have so many people tune into his games on the internet chess club that it would regularly create server disruptions. Now, despite being an international master, Emery had a worldwide fan base, which before the explosion of the internet, it was almost just exclusively grandmasters who would have a big following of fans. So what made Emery Tate so famous? We'll get to the main part last, but first of all, Emery Tate was big on building a personal brand, and he would amplify his personal brand by being a somewhat of a polarizing figure. He would come out with bold statements claiming that he was the best chess tactician in the world. But what made people love Emery so much was his attitude towards the game. He didn't care how many times he would lose a chess game, instead he was solely focused on creating a attacking masterpieces for others to be absolutely amazed with. I've picked out a game of Emery's that demonstrates just how lethal he was and how quickly he could win a chess game. But what makes this game interesting is the mysterious ending and the insane tactic that Tate found to seal the deal. With the white pieces we have a man named Andreas Kornfled who is rated 2312 and with the black pieces we have the one and only Emery Tate. It was played in 1997 at the US Masters in Oak Brook. USA. So Mr. Cornfled opens up with the move c4. This is known as the English opening and there's many ways for black to combat this. Moves like g6, b6 or black can even play the symmetrical variation with the move c5. Instead here today we see the move knight f6 keeping it fairly flexible keeping all of these options wide open so he can transpose into anything he wishes. Now we see the move knight c3 and the move e5 so putting this pawn in the center of the board just controlling some nice squares it's always a good idea to to put your pawns in the center of the board, uh, well, most of the time. And here, knight f3, we see knight c6, knights before bishops, uh, a principle of chess you can try follow, d3. And what's interesting is that white could have pushed the pawn to d4, but decided to only push it one square instead of two, and went d3. And now Tate has had enough of this kind of boring, slow game, and decides to open up the game with d5, forcing white to pretty much do something. And white decides to take this with cd5, knight d5, and e6. Yet again, a white could have pushed this pawn up to e4. Being too passive against Emery Tate normally ends horribly wrong. And we're in for a show today. Tate decides he needs to develop his bishops now, so goes bishop e6, bishop e2, the most played move here by far is bishop e7, but today's game on move 7, we have a completely new game after the move bishop d6 by Tate. White decides to get their king to safety, castles, and uh, not castling here, queen e7. Now, what could this queen e7 move possibly mean? We're gonna see in a couple moves time. Here, we actually understand why this pawn hasn't been pushed up to e4, because the knight is coming in with knight e4, attacking this bishop and just centralizing the knight a bit. So Tate has the option here to castle kingside or he can castle queenside and we're gonna get an attacking violent showdown after castles queenside. White decides that, you know what, this king is here. I don't have a king here, so I can safely push all my pawns up. The reason why castles of opposite sides, as you see, they're completely opposite. Um, the reason why games like these get so aggressive is because normally this king would be on g8, say castle kingside, and black wouldn't be able to get away with pushing all the pawns up the board, as it would completely destroy his position. But now this king is on c8, so he can throw up all these pawns up the board as, as much as he likes. And after this move, castles queen side. The move a3 is played, so white is just preparing maybe for some expansion. Tate does not like this knight on e4, so goes f5, kicking it away, asking it a question. Are you going to go to g5 and go after my light squared bishop, or are you going to just take my dark squared bishop with knight d6, and knight d6 is what is played. Here, rook d6, and uh, this rook is on a nice file now, and Mr. Cornfled decides he needs to get his pieces into the game, and decides on queen c2, and here we see the the first Tate-esque move, g5, bang, pawn up the board, so it's pretty much a showdown here, there's a race, it's gonna get tense, there's a race, here the move d4, asking this pawn a question, are you gonna take, or are you gonna push, Emery decides to gain space with e4, um, this knight is being asked a question, where are you going, goes to the, probably the most active square, e5, after knight e5, and takes, this rook is being attacked, this rook finds a nice little home on c6, attacking this queen, Mr. Corn 
pawn fled decides to get it onto a safer square with a4 also attacking this pawn on a7. So Tate needs to attend to this threat and goes king b8, bishop d2, knight b6. Since this queen is being attacked, it's probably a good idea to move it. Queen a5. Emery actually plays an amazing move. Truly, this is an amazing move. Bishop c4. You may be wondering, how is this move so amazing? Here, I'm going to show you why this move, bishop c4, is so good. White in this position has a lot of weak light squares. And as you see, this dark squared bishop and this queen are combining together to control all the dark squares. Even these pawns control all the dark squares, which means these light squares are actually very weak. What's defending these light squares? And what is stopping black from infiltrating through the light squares? It's this bishop. So exchanging off the defender of the light squares with bishop c4. Here, white does not want to take here because then the knight comes in. So here we see the sad move, rook a to um, e1. And Emery's got these light squares on lock now. Um, white can exchange if he wants, but um, now Emery is pretty much free to roam. Here we see g4, preventing any ideas of h3 and just gaining more space up the board. Um, and now we see a, a fairly bad move. To be honest, I'm going to give this guy the benefit of the doubt here that he forgot that en passant existed because here he played the move f4 because after gf3 this is known as en passant by the way if you're new to chess but after gf3 here emery plays the fairly intuitive move that i'm pretty sure almost everyone watching this video would play well i hope anyway and plays the move rook g8 and you might be thinking yeah this must be good well it must be because here his opponent resigned a bit of a mysterious resignation because it's still not 100 percent clear why this wins but i'll show you really quickly why this actually wins if the king goes to f2, bang, queen h4 is a checkmate. If the king goes to the kind of safer square, h1, here the nasty move, queen h4, threatening queen h2. For example, if a move like queen a4 is played, hanging the queen, then oops, we can actually sacrifice here. Nasty stuff. So just going back to rook g8, after king h1, there is a threat after queen h4 of this move, queen h2. So let's say white tries to prevent it with playing the move e6, just disconnecting the rook from coming here. Then after queen h3, threatening checkmate here. So if rook f2 defending, then you can simply just take here and after takes, it doesn't matter which rook takes because queen f3 anyway. And this is completely winning. That's why Tate's opponent resigned because of the threats of queen h4 and there's loads of other ways for black to do it. So anyway, that is the end of the video. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more videos like this, like and subscribe. I've got a video right here I think you might enjoy. Thank you for watching. Have a good day.